I'm Sandy Eller for VIN News at the Meadowlands, where hundreds of people are taking part in Kosher Fest 2017. More than just an opportunity to munch your way through the aisles, Kosher Fest is a global business event where established brands and startups compete side by side for the attention of kosher decision makers. What's really hot this year? Come on, let's go find out together. We're talking to Harold Weiss, Executive Vice President of Sales for Keiko Royal Wine. You work with supermarket chains that dominate the industry. What kind of response are you seeing from them in terms of kosher foods and kosher products? Well, over the past 30 years or uh, so, a lot of fundamental changes have taken place in the food business as a whole. Uh, 30 years ago, uh, conventional supermarkets were alone. And today you have specialty stores, limited assortment stores, natural food stores, deaf club stores, Sam's Club, BJ's, and so on. And you have conventional supermarkets. Uh, and uh, what happened was, uh, conventional supermarkets offer something that the others don't, which is often variety. A customer can come in and buy everything from soup to nuts under one roof, whether it's for Passover or every day. And also what changed is the variety of kosher foods. Back then it was usually uh, dominated by a few items, or shopping, and filter fish. And today, of course, a company like Geffen, which has everything from soup to nuts, under a strict interpretation of Jewish dietary law, can be found in every supermarket across the country. So we have a lot of different brands, a lot of different products. And today the conventional supermarkets stepped up to the plate by representing a lot of different brands and a lot of different items to the kosher consumer, who's not only looking for kosher products, but looking for a kosher lifestyle. So they are able to attract that audience. So in theory, if I walked into a supermarket in Utah, I might be able to find a Giffen product? Probably, yes. It's pretty impressive. Next, we have Effie Landsberg, Executive Vice President for Kosher Sales for Keiko. Over the years, supermarkets changed. When you and I grew up, we had little mom and pop stores on the corner that had three different types of crackers and not a whole lot else. Today, we have mega gourmet stores that are beyond anything any of us could have ever imagined. Where do you see kosher food stores evolving within the next four or five years? Well, like you said, Mm, it's very rare that you find mom and pop corner stores opening up now in the kosher market. Today, everybody's opening up supermarkets because the consumer is really dictating what they want. And the pachka of the, of the shopper has really gone out of the shopping and into the kitchen. Whereas perhaps when we were growing up, consumers were going to the butcher and to the grocery store and to the bakery and to the fruit store and to the fish store to get their various needs. The consumer today wants everything under one roof. Their pachka moved out of the shopping and has moved into the kitchen. They will demand many more different ingredients. They want a different uh, variety of dishes being served. They're willing to be more open to try new things. So the, super, so the stores have to reinvent themselves and grow to create these demands. Do you think that over time, big stores, the, the massive mega gourmet supermarkets will slowly be edging out the smaller type stores that are more, you know, your Makola style store? Or do you think no, not necessarily. No, not necessarily. I think the marketplace. I think the marketplace has contained both, and 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 will continue to contain both. I think there's, you know, there's always there's always a need for it. Okay, pop quiz for both of you. What do you think is the next big trend in kosher food? I'll let you go first. You're older. <laughs> I think ethnic kosher is going to be in demand. What you know, kosher you Mexican products, kosher Italian, kosher Chinese, kosher natural, which is something we've been successful with. So different areas of cuisine, as the consumer demands more, we're growing the, the base of the availability of products. It's an excellent answer. I also happen to think that the next frontier is really going to be the consumer is going to demand a healthier for you, better for you uh, type of brand. Um, we see it now emerging that kosher consumers are more health conscious than ever. So is there another Keiko brand soon to be born about special healthy? Check back with me next year. See you next year then. Thank you so much. Thank Begev Adi, co-director of Unilever Israel. Unilever is a $65 billion company, and yet here you are developing products for the kosher market. What makes a company the size of Unilever look and say kosher is attractive enough that we want to actually make things for you? First, we produce kosher moe products in Israel, so our base is kosher product. What we are doing, we are developing these for the American market, which sometimes have different uh, flavors and different things that they have different needs. So we are developing product, and actually we want to bring some cultural product into the American market, which based from religious, uh, Jewish religion, also Israelis, and all uh, those who are in between. So uh, definitely this is a potential market for us. 
So you can go into a store in Wyoming and you're going to be able to eat falafel there. Actually, yes. We want to give the flavor of Israel also around the world. And it's also aligned with the current trends of health. So falafel made of hummus. Hummus is now spread everywhere. Uh, it is uh, considered to be a very uh, healthy food. And if we have the falafel, which is very original Israeli food, we can spread it also here, then we are, we'll go for it. Do you find that something like falafel, which is a very ethnic product, sells better in places like the New York area, the California area, with a lot of Jewish people, or do you find that it really sells well across the board? It actually sells well across the board. It is better, of course, when it's more Israeli, uh, uh, Israelis than uh, Orthodox Jewish, but also the Orthodox Jewish knows falafel from Bnei Brak and Jerusalem. They see it on the streets, so they're familiar with the products, and they want to have the same flavors also at the home. Tell me about these guys, your sour cream and onion crackers. How do you have sour cream and onion crackers that taste so dairy-like with no dairy in them at all? So one of our uh, key capability is to develop parve products with a non-parve flavor. So this is, it's a huge market in Israel. So for instance, we produce ice cream parve, which is uh, uh, flavored like, uh, tastes like a uh, regular ice cream. We, uh, one of our key pro uh, product is a uh, uh, chicken soup without soup, parve, without chicken. So also these products, we are one of our key capabilities is to give the flavors that we are used to from the dairy environment, but with the non-dairy ingredients. So this is our key, pro key products in the American market. Sells like uh, amazing and hope it will sell more. Do you find there's a particular salad that is based on these crackers? Do you find that that one product, that one salad recipe has done something for your sales or you wouldn't be familiar with that? Actually, I, I got used, I got uh, familiar with this usage, also only here. In Israel, we don't use it, use it uh, for salads. I heard it's for you, it's a salad. Uh, and I think it works with all the salads that you're looking for crunchy uh, texture. Then this is your product. Miriam Pascal, a.k.a. Overtime Cook, a.k.a. the hottest cookbook, well, hottest food blogger whose brand new book is literally the newest thing to hit the kosher market. Yeah, it, today. it debuts today. today. Tell me about real life kosher cooking. Okay, so firstly, I just want to say that I've been working on this book since, I would say, the day that my last book came out, Something Sweet, came out about two years ago, and I've been working on this ever since. This is like my heart and soul in, in, in a book form, and I'm so excited about it. I was excited about Something Sweet, too, don't get me wrong, but this book is really like the food I make for my family. It's like the food I make when I have guests coming, the food that I cook when... I have no time and I need to get dinner on the table. And this is real life, really, really, I mean it. It's really all about real life. And the recipes are, my goal was always that the recipes should be doable, approachable, things like when you go through the book, you saw it yesterday, right? When you go through the book, you're supposed to like every page be like, I want to make that, I want to eat that, right? Is that, is that, absolutely. Did, did, I, did I nail it? You absolutely did. So your niche really is, you see this a lot on social media. You don't just have a page on Facebook. You have readers constantly conversing with you, talking to you. What can I do about this? What can I substitute for this? You really seem to have gotten corner of the market on, I'm here for you. Let's get simple I things. I incorporate that so much into the book because I, I anticipate what the questions are going to be before people ask them. And I incorporate it into the recipes. So I put in variations because I know if I tell you to use, you know, I don't know, if I tell you to use one ingredient in a recipe, someone's going to ask me, can I use this instead? So I just, right off the bat, will tell you, can you, that you could use that, that you could make that substitute. Every single recipe in the book tells you whether or not you can freeze it, and it gives you details on how to freeze it, how to defrost it, how to reheat it, because I know people are going to ask. So I take the questions I know people ask, and I incorporate it into the recipes, so you don't even have to ask. Okay, we're talking to Jeremy Solzbacher of Ginger Tipple, which is... Basically, if you took ginger and beer and put them together and they had a baby, this is what it tastes like. Almost. 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 Okay. Because most, uh, there are ginger beers where they take a regular beer and they add ginger, but then it wouldn't be kosher Pesach. So this is a kosher Pesach beer called Ginger Tipple. Tell me what is in this. It's, well, there's ginger, sugar, kosher Pesach yeast, water, obviously, hops, Again, kosher Pesach, which was quite difficult to find. Uh, honey and some lemon juice. So you do a first fermentation. Of the ginger? Of the ginger with the sugar. And then you add the hops. And then you filter everything. Well, actually, you filter, but it's, it's sieved. And then it goes for a second fermentation in the bottle with a bit of honey and lemon. 
What made you look at Ginger and say, hey, cool, I want to make a beer out of this? I love beer and eight and a half days without beer is going to be very, very difficult for me. So I decided to create my own beer and I'd heard of the concept of ginger beer, of alcoholic ginger beer. I looked up recipes, but nothing like this. I developed the whole thing from scratch, the quantities, the timing, the temperatures. And today we have the regular ginger beer, which is, this is with the old label. And we're moving to a, a new, more hip style label, which is designed by some non-Jewish friends of mine in Belgium. So same beer, just different label to make it look cooler. Yep. We also have something for, for the real aficionados, a ginger creek, which is made with sour cherries. First you ferment the beer, and then you add the cherries, and it takes about six or seven weeks for the cherries to ferment. And then you have to bottle it, a couple of other secrets along the way. Also Kasha Le Pesach. Also Kasha Le Pesach. I'm also working on a dark beer, which will be a, bit, uh, a tiny bit sweeter, which uses apple and pear syrup. And a different way of hopping as well, different types of hops, different techniques. And I've got a four and a half cent one, which will be available in kegs for Pesach this year. So when you make your barbecue, you'll be able to pull, pull, pull beer for your, for your friends. And I'm also working on a high-end 11% uh, version made with pure organic ginger and aged with oak. Where is this available now? At the moment, it's only available in Belgium. I'm looking for distributors and, and investors as well, obviously. Uh, the main part is an importer, distributors. But from what I'm seeing here at this show, the, re the response is just tremendous. People will see it in the shops. They won't hesitate to buy it. What percentage of alcohol is this? Just under 9%. But you don't feel it. Really not. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. So nice meeting you. So David Weiss of Prima Spice. You have a really cool panko. Um, I've never seen anything like this. Tell me a little bit about it. Well, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to introduce my uh, new panko, our new panko. Um, it's, what's unique about this panko is, first of all, let's start with the flavor. It's falafel flavor. We have a lot of other interesting flavors, too. We have barbecue. We have onion garlic. Um, so besides the quality and the fact that we're using our own signature spices in here, which every, our spices are known to everybody. Uh, what's unique, actually unique about this is everybody knows seasoned panko, by the time you get done with the cooking, the flavor's gone. And that's where a lot of women or a lot of chefs are adding their own spices, whether it's salt, sugar, garlic, whatever they need to add. We put a lot of time and efforts in researching exactly to get the right amount of flavor to have that flavor from the beginning of the cooking process all the way to the end of the cooking process when you're taking out the product from the oven or from the frying pan. And that's basically, a, in my opinion, a very unique product. We are talking to Benjamin Weiss and Martin Weiss, co-presidents of Elegant Desserts, whose Fritza won Best Frozen Dessert category in Kosher Fest this year. Who wants to tell me what a Fritza is? We'll start. The, our concept is that we like to give the choices for caterers for different vien, for the Viennese tables for different stations. So we always had gelato station, chocolate station. So now we came up with another station. It's called the Fritza station. A caterer will go and buy six, seven, eight of these pizza pies, Fritza pies, depending how many people, and they're going to make a station out of it. It's top with a, it has a moist chocolate chip cookie on the bottom, and different toppings on top. It could be a razzle, peanut butter and jelly, cookies and cream, or a rocky road, any of these type of ice creams. All these ice creams are toppings. When they do is they take a slicer and they slice it in different stations. So as the people come, like a pizza, so you'll get you have a choice of different flavors of different ice creams, and all these ice creams will be as a Viennese table. So it just is an enhances the simcha, enhances the Viennese. It's another station for the caterers to have. Obviously, parv item, right? Yes, all our products are parv. And how do I get one of these to my house if I'm making a simcha? So the best part right now is that we can ship it online and straight to your house. You order it online and we'll get to your house delivered. With, with dry ice and straight the way it is, it fits into the freezer, it's not a big product. And it's great for uh, desserts, for company, you now Hanukkah coming up, or all the occasions, and it's, people love it, they're ordering it, and everybody, we're getting great feedback, and everybody is very happy with the product. And if I want to eat the whole thing myself, is that okay? It works, I'm sure you're gonna enjoy it. <laughs> hey, this is Yoni Seletsky of Yoni's Pretzel Chala, and that challah that you're holding there, tell me that that's a toy challah, because it's so perfect looking, can't possibly be real. No, this is real. This is a real thing. So this is our pretzel challah. 
Uh, it's vegan, egg-free, it's parv, uh, pas Yisrael, yashan. This is a very, very versatile bread because other challahs you'd imagine you'd only eat on Shabbos. This challah is great all week too. We have sandwich breads. This could be used for paninis. You cut, it's, it's shorter, so you could actually use it as a sandwich bread if you cut it open and hinge it. You can make three sandwiches for your kids in one shot, build everything. Um, we've grown in versatility with different sizes. We have mini sizes if you're only two at home and don't need a whole challah. We have rolls, obviously. We have a whole line of 10 different flavors. We've just gone pretzel crazy, really. We have jalapeno, we have a sweet medley of cherries and dried fruits. Um, we have a whole wheat, an olive and zaatar. It's one of our biggest sellers. Uh, and the everything like a bagel is a New York favorite. What makes a challah a pretzel challah and not a regular challah? So it has a pretzel crust. So it's, it's, it's essentially just a very big pretzel in the shape of a challah. So it doesn't have the egg, it doesn't have the cholesterol, it doesn't have any margarine, it doesn't have any of those things that make a traditional challah a challah, but the shape. But when you cut this open on Shabbos, you're going to get a really soft inside and a super crunchy crust. This bread, it's so super soft, you're going to fall in love with it. And the crust is going to complement it. The, the colors are going to contrast beautifully on your table. You'll put platters. Everyone will be impressed and happy. Hey, we're talking to Henry Abuna, founder of Bees Beverage Corporation. He makes honey water. Tell me, what made you start making honey water? Uh, because my grandmother used to make it when I was young. And then when I would get sick, she would make honey water for me, and then I would drink it, and obviously, you know what happens after that. So one day, I was trying to make it myself. I couldn't really kind of figure it out. And then I made it. Later on, I said, you know, this could be my grandmother's recipe. I called over at home, talked to my mother. She said, yes. She told me how to make it. I made it. So this is not just watered down honey? No, it's not just watered down honey. Most other drinks use regular sugar, refined sugar, or artificial sweeteners. We use just honey. That way you can get all the health benefits of honey at the same time. So tell me what this is good for. Uh, it's good for, it helps you with the immune system, it gives you a lot of energy. Honey, if you, um, in the olden days, the Olympians in Greece, they used to drink, uh, eat a lot of honey so that they can get a lot of energy before they go to the Olympics. So honey can give you some good energy. Um, it helps you with the immune system. You get a lot of vitamins. We also added some vitamins A, C, and E to this so that it can help you with the immune system as well. So because those are the antioxidant vitamins. I have Ronnie Katz, a nice Jewish boy from Dallas, Texas, who makes Ron's hot sauce called Sauces for the Brave. You tell me why this is Sauce for the Brave. That's right, how are y'all doing? Uh, this is Sauces for the Brave because these sauces, they have such heat, not all of them, but the habanero, for instance, has so much heat in it that you gotta be brave to try it. You also gotta be brave to admit that you can taste something and know what good flavor is. So with my sauces, you get good flavor and you get good heat at the end. I see you have some special yarmulkes there. If you're Jewish and you like hot sauce, you got to wear a Ron Hot yarmulke. I'm not going to take off my hat to wear a kippah, but you got to have one. You all got to go out and get some of this sauce, and you got to come to Texas because Texas is really the place to be. Yeah, I gotta say. But if we're in New York, where would we find it? Well, right now in New York, first of all, you can get it on Amazon, and you can uh, search Ron Hot Tomato Stuff, and you can get it, now get it at Gourmet Glot in five towns. Is that the really hot one? This is the really hot one. That's Go. the really hot one? Are you brave? No, no, no. No, no I'm a wimp. Wow, that's really good. Tell me what Celtic sea salt is and why I would want to use it. All right. Well, back in 1976, the founder of our company, Jacques Delangre, brought this salt over to the United States. It's a raw, hand-harvested, natural crystal sea salt. Nothing's been added. Nothing's been taken away. It's sea salt in its whole form. Therefore, it maintains all the trace minerals that our ocean has. These trace minerals are things like calcium, potassium, magnesium. These tell your cell walls what to do with the sodium rather than treat it like a poison. So it's more bioavailable to our cells. So people who have to limb restrict their sodium, would they be able to use this more freely than regular salts? In my opinion, yes, because since it's just natural crystal sea salt, there's not been any bleaching or treating or heating or stripping it of its natural minerals. So it is naturally lower in sodium than say a regular table salt because it hasn't been adultered in any way. Okay, you're Chaim Asaf, CEO of Schneider's. What is new in candy this year that you think my grandchildren are going to get excited about? Well, this is new in candy this year. This is a product which have been uh, worked out 
very nicely. You have the outside, which is a sweet crust, just to cover in a special powder, a really fizzy and sour powder. I'm going to open it for you. You can see the powder coming out. Yeah. So once you get the sweet crust, let me try it. Maybe I think you should try to. Okay. Please. We call it a tea choc. It's a chocolate square on top of a petit beurre. This is being a hit since we launched it last year. And it's a product that sells in dark and milk. Both. Which one sells better? Surprisingly enough, the milk. Because the chocolate has been made by Schneider's. It's a real Schneider's chocolate, so it fits 100% the biscuit. Actually, if you want to discover some very special chocolate, this has been a hit since last Passover. We launched on the chocolate. We had the big buyers come to sit here just to have a piece of it. It's uh, a chocolate. We made it very thick, very rich, roasted almonds or roasted whole hazelnuts. So you have plenty of flavor and you re it's really rich and that flavorful. Even your packaging is very reminiscent of the high-end chocolate and not what you typically are accustomed to seeing on your supermarket shelves in your kosher store. It's very soft. It feels like baby powder, not grainy or... Well, actually it's not powder. Whatever you have inside is really liquid. Liquid? It's liquid. Oh my goodness. Yes, it's liquid. Let me open one for you. And if you see, we have an oven here. No way, you're baking these on the spot. It is bakeable on the spot. If you come back in a few minutes... I'm talking to Josh Goldenberg of Sabatino Truffles. I wish that you could be in the room here with me because the smell of what is here with all these truffles is simply unbelievable. Everything smells just beautifully truffly and there's a whole lot of products here. Tell me what you have. I've got, I mean, anything you can imagine truffle. What we've got on the table here is every, everything truffle kosher. So I personally make everything that you could imagine like flour and balsamics with truffles. Here I've got everything. Chocolate? No, no, no. Mushrooms. So truffles are a tuber, like a fungus, a mushroom. Could we do chocolate in truffle? <laughs> we could. We could. If you try it, let me know how it works we, out. We've actually done it in the past. We've handed them out as Christmas gifts. They're, they're okay. Okay. You kind of lose the actual truffle flavor in the chocolate. <laughs> okay, so what do you have here for the kosher consumer? We've got truffle salt. It's probably the, the, the big one. This is our bread and butter. Um, uh, all the chefs across the country know the blue can as the can of truffle salt. You open this, the whole kitchen smells like truffle salt. What is that price out at for the consumer? Uh, for a chef, it's probably 23 bucks, something like that, 21, 23. So if I bought this from my kitchen, how long would this last for? Way too long. You wouldn't buy this. You would buy this. Really? Yeah. Okay. What does that one cost? This one's going to cost you maybe 15, 16 bucks, something like that. And that's going to last me how long? A long time. This will last you three years if you don't open it. To use it, it'll probably last you a good year. Does it dissipate over time once you open it? Yeah. Yeah, a little bit. But no, you'll be good for at least a year. Especially if you want to put some saran wrap onto the, the cover when you reseal it. You'll be fine. Okay, what other fun truffle products do you have? Um, truffle honey. I've got truffle oils. I've got truffle zest. This is the world's first truffle seasoning. What is truffle zest? This is a Italian summer truffle dehydrated, ground into a powder, mixed with carob powder. So it's the most versatile, the most affordable, and the easiest to work with truffle products on the market. Right Define affordable. Um, this costs 15 bucks. And a tiny little bit of that is going to give me that really amazing truffle flavor? Yeah. Yeah, my mom has one of these from our first production run two years ago, and it's only half empty, and we put it on everything. So think truffle fries, popcorn, scrambled eggs, mac and cheese, mashed potatoes, anything pasta or risotto. Really. Okay, I am talking to Peas, Love, and Carrots. Um, did your parents name you Peas, Love, and Carrots, or that's just what you use on social media? So they named me Peas, Love, and Carrots, but because it was too long for everybody to say, they also call me Danielle. That's, that's really good. So tell me, you are on Instagram. And 
And what do you do on Instagram? I'm on Instagram. I have a website. I make um, cooking videos for kosher.com. And basically, I just cook every day with my audience on Instagram, on my Insta stories. We have a really good time. Um, we love each other. We talk to each other. Um, and we just interact. It's like a community. It's a peas, love, and carrots community, really. And we bounce ideas off each other. We have different programs. Like we have, we just finished Chodesh Bari right after Sukkot. We started a month long of like just healthy, mindful eating, trying to make family friendly food. Sometimes I do kitchen destinations, like with my kids, and we put it on stories so that people could see it. We've done Brazil, where we learn about that country every day of the week, and one night we cook very authentic food from there. Um, it just gets the kids like trying different things and figuring out that they actually like things that they think they don't like. Um, and we just cook together and we have a good time. So this is so cool because five years ago you didn't have these communities of people all over the world who are suddenly friends with each other, who are sharing recipes and discussing their common problems and I tried this and this didn't work and oh my gosh, I've come to be coming for Shabbos, what am I gonna do? This didn't exist. What are your thoughts on the way social media has done so much for kosher cooks, mommies, I mean it doesn't have to be kosher, but in our case it is to say it's kosher fest, <laughs> but just mothers, parents, um, anyone who's just interested in food, what are your thoughts on how that's transformed things? I think it's amazing. I really do. I think it's incredible that we all have resources where we can connect and talk to each other. And it's not easy every day. It's not easy every day to be a mother or to be anybody and put food on the table, even if it's just for yourself. Getting the motivation to cut up vegetables for a salad is hard sometimes. I, you know, like if I, I always tell if I had an elf, I would want one job. Just cut my vegetables for me. <laughs> Peel them and cut them. Okay, that's it. But like, really, so it's just nice to be able to work together and bounce ideas. I get to meet people that are from Switzerland and Australia and Paris and all over the world. People that I would have never met. Jews from women. Not even any woman that's just trying to make their family food. We're the same. We all have this common denominator. And it's so nice to get to know each other and interact with each other. Mayor Rose. This is... Launch Energy and Granola Bar. And what is so cool about this is, for people like me who can't stand coffee and you need caffeine, you eat one of these and you are not falling asleep on your way home from Lakewood. Tell me a little bit about the product. And you won't be hungry. So basically, this is the only granola bar that takes the high energy ingredients from, uh, from energy drinks and puts it into a bar. So there are energy bars and there are energy drinks, but there's no such thing as an energy drink bar. So now, if you're hungry, if you don't have time for breakfast or you don't have time to stop for lunch. So there's one, you can just have one bar and you'll be good to go the whole day. That's what I have one bar for breakfast and one bar for lunch and I'm good. Brian Allen of WBM, Himalayan Salt and Health. Tell me what it is you're doing on this block of pink salt here. So we are cooking different things on the block of salt. The block of salt is put directly on the heat source. Right now we have um, an Italian chicken sausage and some onions that we're grilling up. So basically the idea is whatever you put on onto the salt block, the, the, the seasoning from the salt is going to transfer into what you're cooking. So everything we're putting on here doesn't have any seasoning on. It's going on naked, so to speak. So, um, and then cook time is normal cook time. Uh, the salt will disperse the heat evenly and it'll cook it evenly. So. What benefits, why would I want to cook on a block of salt instead of just putting that same onion in my, on my grill or in my oven? So, like I said, it's going to pick up some of the seasoning, so it's going to be a little, it, it's different um, when you season something after it as, as opposed to when it's cooking on it and picking up the seasoning. It's going to be taste slightly differently. Also, there's 84 different minerals in pink salt, and that's actually what's giving out um, the pink color. So you are picking up some of those minerals in the salt as well. Plus, if you have a dinner party, it's pretty kind of cool to be cooking on a block of salt, right? So, How much does that block of salt over there weigh? This one right here is about 30 pounds. Um, they are, it's literally like a rock, so they're not, um, they're not light, but they're durable. So you can get, on a two inch block like this, you're going to get about 150 to 200 uses out of it. To clean it, really all you're doing is pouring a little water, maybe a little lemon juice, um, and scraping it with the back of a grill brush or a knife and just taking the char off of it. It is salt, so it's antibacterial, it's antimicrobial, so you're never gonna get any growth on it. 
Um, works really well on a grill. If you have a grill outside, just like I have, I have one this size on my grill outside and I just leave it there all year round. It just, it lives on the grill, so. And what happens to it as you use it? Does it start to melt or to dissipate? So it doesn't melt. The, 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 you're not going to get anything hot enough to literally melt it. It will start to dissolve the more you cook it and the more you scrape it. It's going to start to get a little concave, right? So after a period of time, it will get thin enough in the middle where the weight of the outside will make it break. Um, but again, it, you're looking at really like 150 to, to 200 uses, so it's going to be it's going to be around for a while. There's actually a, a cold application for it as well, so you can stick it in the freezer for a couple hours, bring it out, and you can serve sushi on it, or uh, put a scoop of caramel ice cream on it, and it'll pick up some of the salt as you're eating it, and it won't melt. So there, it's really um, it's really a combination of the functionality of it and then also just, like I said, if you want to wow some dinner guests or if you're a caterer and want to use it some, somehow in your um, catering services as well. So. What does a block of salt like this cost if I wanted to buy it? So I believe the big one retails for somewhere between 44 and 49. Uh, the 12 inch is like 34 to 39. The 8 inch is um, 24 to 29. And then the smaller ones are really uh, 12 to 14 dollars. So on a per usage basis, uh, it's really not that expensive at all. So when you talk about things that are new and exciting, gefilte fish is not usually what comes to mind. And yet, here I am talking to David Most, Associate Vice President of Marketing for Manischewitz, with an amazing new gefilte fish product, all new for this year, for Pesach? Uh, uh, introducing it for uh, this Passover, yes. Okay. Let me hear what you have. Well, we're very excited about this. Uh, Manischewitz for many years has been associated with gefilte fish. Uh, largely we've been in uh, the shelf stable or jarred uh, category. Uh, but this year we're launching into frozen. Uh, we are going to have two SKUs. One is the uh, standard frozen loaf. But we're coming forward with something that no one else in the marketplace has, which is a pre-sliced gefilte fish. Uh, it's going to be packaged in a stand-up uh, gusseted bag uh, and with, uh, with kind of a resealable pouch to it. Um, and we are just couldn't be more thrilled about it. It'll be launched in Passover. Um, some of the benefits is, you know, some people don't want to eat a whole loaf at one time. Uh, and we, we did some market research and we found that some people just want to have an ability to, you know, uh, cook a slice or two. And... Um, and not have to use up the whole loaf. So we think this is a, a big uh, convenience for people. Um, and it's a much shorter cook time as well. As you know, a, a loaf uh, can cook up to about an hour. And this is about- 90 minutes minimum. Yeah, yeah. And um, this is about a 15 minute cook time. Um, and you can prep it any way you want. You could bake it, you could fry it, you could boil it. So you could have all the different ways to, that you're normally you know, prepare for gefilte fish. So on any given weekend, my husband says, why aren't we having gefilte fish? And I'm saying, because I'm not making one piece. Yeah. I, can, I don't have to hack through a loaf of frozen gefilte fish, That's and right. I don't have to throw out half a loaf of gefilte fish. Right. I can take out one piece and cook it. Yes, and uh, a lot less smell, too, in the house. Uh, it's a power Rothkopf, Coco Kosher Korea. Ha Korean, happens to be located of all places in Lakewood, New Jersey. I want to hear about kosher kimchi. Well, kimchi is a thousands of years of wisdom, of the full of uh, probiotics, and uh, gives you a great digestion help, and the uh, skins and everything else has uh, antibiotics, probiotics, and antidepressant. Yep. Yeah. So if you eat kimchi, you're going to be cheered up. Yep. Yeah. What is, how is kimchi made? Well, this is a fermented vegetables and especially they're not all the vegetables are fermentable. You know, before they get fermented and nice and good, sweet, delicious taste, it will rot. But this is um, special like napa with a radish grown in Korea and made it all naturally and they're fermented and um, it's very healthy. So I, I know that this is totally not related, but sauerkraut, for example, is made out of fermented cabbage. What would be the difference between sauerkraut and kimchi? Well, sauerkraut, it's probably just with a vegetables and salt and ferment. This has a garlic and ginger, scallions, and uh, hot pepper powder, which makes you uh, antidepressant. That's so interesting. And how long, is this the only kosher kimchi that's available? The only kosher kimchi in the world. Okay, Rachel Korb from Yardane. Tell me what's new and interesting this year. 
I will show you the regular Cabernet. So this is basically a straight shooter. People like this because it's one grapes, the Cabernet. And so people like this one a lot. Do you get more complexity from a mixture of grapes as opposed to like, are you better off getting a mixture of grapes or sticking with one grape that you know is really solid? Um, it really just depends on your palate. Um, I think people that are more experienced with wine like a straight grape, like a straight Cabernet, straight Merlot, just because, not saying it's safe, it's just a little bit smoother. You know what you're getting, it's more of like one like rich like taste. Um, as, as opposed to like mixing grapes together, which is still good, it's just, it's just a different taste. There's a lot of different stuff going on. It's kind of like, um, you ever watch uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory? Um, what's it called? Everlasting Gobstopper, and it's like a full course meal, and it goes through different stages, different courses. So kind of like that with the wine, so you kind of taste all the different grapes at like different points like in your mouth, so just not one straight through like one grape. What is your biggest seller at Yardane? Our biggest seller? Well, I think the Rom is pretty good. This is a pretty good seller. This is one of our higher end wines. What kind of, what kind of wine is that? This is a red wine. And this is, I will tell you, this is a Cabernet Sauvignon and Syrah and Merlot. And so it's a, it's a little bit of a mix, but it's um, mostly Cabernet. And people like it. And this is a limited edition I see on the front, 54 barrels yes. produced. So it's 2013. And how many bottles of this would, well, I'm sorry, uh, that answer, we just answered that. What does a bottle like this cost? Uh, this is about 250. Can I taste that one? <laughs> she wants the good stuff. I do, I do. Yeah. Tell me what you think. Is this dry, sweet, or somewhere in between? It's it's dry. I'm supposed to swirl it first, aren't I? You're supposed to swirl it, smell it, <laughs> and then kind of keep it in your mouth and go. And I'm not spitting because this is really, really, re I, I am not okay. spitting. This is really, really, really good. This is a fabulous bottle. What sells well in your sweet wines? Um, so we have a Moscato which is a sweet dessert wine. Um, if you like sweet wine, this is your choice. Is, it, is a Moscato by definition bubbly? Um, there's a little fizz to it. It's not so carbonated, it's kind of subtle, but it's definitely a sweet white wine. It's good for kiddish, and it's just good for the ladies, some of the guys. I know you like it also, no judgment. <laughs> Mendel Pitmaster, Rabbi Q. First of all, do you have a real name? Me yeah, Mendel Siegel. Okay. Otherwise known as Rabbi Q. Do you actually have Mendel. smicha or does it just I, sound good? Of course I, I actually have smicha. I would never pose. Well, yeah, I have smicha, but I don't have a congregation, so I'm not a... Uh, I beg to differ. I think you have a congregation because look at this congregation you have right here. Tell me what you have here today at Kosher Fest. All right, so I've got my original Kansas City barbecue sauce. Are you from Kansas? Where are you from originally? I'm from Chicago originally, but spent 11 years in Kansas City. Just moved to Miami, actually, about three months ago. So when you talk about authentic Kansas City, you really, you really mean it. That's where I learned barbecue. I uh, moved there. I would go in the tray. I'd be around tray places or businesses where they'd be catering and smelling the food and figure. Like, and, and my mind was blown by the concept. I was like, how do I? I couldn't go out and buy it. Nobody was doing a kosher at that time. Nobody. So, so I, I had to figure out how to do it myself. And I started, started smoking meat in my backyard, started doing catering, pop-ups, bit by bit, which led me to start my line. And uh, now I'm a restaurant in Surfside, Florida, backyard barbecue. Cool. So tell me, we think that we know what barbecue is, or we at least know how to barbecue. We go outside, we throw a steak on the grill and say, hey, we barbecued. Tell me what real barbecue means. So first of all, in Kansas City, if you say you're going to barbecue and you do steak and burgers, and dog, they'll, some, they'll get mad at you. Because that's not barbecue. That's barbecue, grill, mean, that's barbecue means pig? Barbecue means slow smoking meat. doesn't have to be pig. It could be cow. It could be brisket. It could be beef ribs. It could be chicken. But barbecue means slow smoking. Define slow. So between the temperatures of 200 and 300 degrees, it's more that it's indirect. So when you're grilling, you have your fire. You put your meat right on the fire. With barbecue, your fire's on the side, and you're putting your meat next to it. So it's cooking indirectly and it just takes longer you get a tender succulent delicious uh, piece of meat if you know what you're doing so that's how i got into it and then i started competing in contests and i started winning and so you were the kosher guy and you won contests yes non-kosher contests i i never full out won a non-kosher but i've won some awards at non-kosher contests and i've won a number of kosher ones etc 
And that's what got me to start doing my own barbecue sauce and seasoning, trying to help people at home, help bar people who are getting into barbecue. I have my Kansas City rub. What's in there? It's got it's got chili, it's got sugar, it's got salt, it's got pepper, it's got other undisclosed spices I can't tell you in public. Okay. And you use it on literally any meat. You could then grill it, smoke it, whatever it is, but it's I mean, this on a brisket, then smoked eight to ten hours till tender, unbelievable, just like that. Can I smoke a brisket in my oven at home? It's tricky to actually smoke uh, in your oven. You could use your grill to smoke uh, by setting the fire on the side, throwing a little bit of wood on it, whether it's chips or chunks. Smoke in your oven, you're never going it, it, to, it'll be kind of difficult. But you could get a little bit of that flavor using my product. But I suggest people broaden the horizon a little bit, try, try to smoke, try an electric or gas smoker to start, and then get into coal and wood as you get on. That's, I mean, that's my first one was a little electric smoker. Didn't get the flavor I wanted, but that's how I started dabbling. And now I, it's, it's, it's a terrible addiction, but it's great at the same time. Is this something that the average person could pull off in their backyard in Brooklyn? I'm not going to say they're going to start winning contests out the gate, but yes, anybody could, could do barbecue. Takes a little bit of patience, a little bit of time. Now there's so many resources out there. Hani Schusterman, California Gourmet Belgian Vegan Chocolate. Tell me a little bit about what you have coming out that's new and exciting. Okay, so we have new and exciting products. Our original product, four years ago, we had our main line, 45% cocoa, fresh, new batches made every two months, delicious, melts well, bakes well. The next new product we had was the Kosher Fest winner in Pesach. Kosher Pesach, soy-free, nut-free, dairy-free, delicious, creamy, amazing. And the newest product in this year's new product competition is the 72% cocoa chunks, also nut-free, totally vegan, no cross-contamination with wheat, gluten, or fish, or dairy, nothing in the facility of the manufacturing and nothing in the packing facility. Tell me why you would want to use chocolate chunks as opposed to chocolate chips. So people like to have in cookies, they like to have different shapes in cookies. They like to have, if you, you want to taste it, it's a very higher, stronger taste. Um, for example, a lot of chefs like to have a very bitter chocolate in their cookie because then they can put more brown sugar into their cookie dough and they can get very strong. It's very strongly chocolate. It's not sweet, right. but it's chocolate. There's a lot of power. There's a lot of pop with that Belgian California gourmet taste. And what they like to do when they have more sugar in the batter instead of more sugar in the chocolate is it creates those nice cracks, those nice lines that make the cookies look homemade. They're chewy, they're full of flavor, full of richness, and it balances out the bitter with the sweet. I want to hear about smoked chocolate because smoked chocolate sounds like an idea whose time has really, really come. So the winner of this year's hot dog contest, they included the smoked chocolate into their... And a hot dog. That's what they just did a few aisles away. We just got the... Kitchen tested one, their hot dog with the smoked chocolate chips. So she's interviewing, yes. Yeah, so if you want to smell it, you smell this. Oh my gosh, that's like brisket. Wait, 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 I gotta try this. It's incredible. That is truly incredible. When is this gonna be available? So this is something we've just been getting reviews and getting examples of usage. Uh, we can make, uh, there's a niche market, it would have to be small packages and so fresh to keep the strong taste. It smells a lot like a bonfire, would you say, a fireplace, you know, a cold winter, hot fire. This is like a great shidduch. This is smoke and chocolate coming together and I don't know exactly what I would do with this, but I mean, I would just eat it by the handful straight from the bag. So a lot of food experts have mentioned the idea of putting it into a beef chili, mm -hmm. a chicken mole, chicken. Yeah. something savory. Um, I did something sweet, I melted them and put mini marshmallows into the mixture and then placed it on graham cracker pieces in the freezer for two minutes and had an amazing s'mores sweet. I'm chocolate. thinking this would make an incredible cookie, something just totally unexpected. It has some pop, it has some smoke, very unusual with the chocolate, but our, our friends that are loving their smoker have decided that with our supply of chocolate, we just have to combine the smoke and the chocolate together and make that combination. Awesome. That was just a taste of Kosher Fest. From vegan jalapeno pretzel chala to the amazing health benefits of Korean kimchi to smoked chocolate, which is so incredibly good, Kosher Fest is all about what's new and exciting in the kosher world. For Vin News, I'm Sandy Eller at the Meadowlands.